So study first to correct in yourself what you blame in others. Correct in yourself what you blame in others. Plant first in your own soul what you wish your neighbor to possess. Make yourself the first target of your zeal. Make yourself the first target of your zeal. I'm telling you, in here, that's the problem. That's the, that's the destroyer of families, vocations, relationships, individuals. Um, if you don't take control of what's coming in and what you're paying attention to, you will destroy yourself and everybody around you. So be the target of your own zeal because that zeal is also just another thing the devil can just chuck in there. Then you start focusing on that and you zealously want to do this good thing and it leads to destruction. Only when the fire is well kindled within uh, will, it, will its warmth spread. For what is near at hand must be first a flame before what is distant can be reached. Concentrate then, first of all, upon yourself. Build up your own character first by way of daily life that is exemplary and a zeal for your own personal righteousness. And so will others take example from what they see in you. It's a good thing to want to change people's um, negative attributes uh, that are around us, but it just doesn't work that way. Um, it just doesn't work. I mean, I've been in community life a long time. Some people are just going to go the wrong way. But if we focus on them going the wrong way, some of us will follow them down the wrong way. Or we'll become so centralized or so focused on them that it actually corrupts our way of thinking because we get so, so, so upset about it and feel that we have to distance ourselves from, etc., etc. But those individuals uh, may be helped, what he's saying here, by, the simple, by simply seeing somebody that's fervently. This is what I try to explain to the married people. Um, you know, it's not just the wives that are, you know, having a difficult time with their husbands. The husbands sometimes have a very difficult time with their wives. It goes both ways because you have different personality types and stuff like that. But either way, the one that's, whoever's the one kind of beating up on the other one, I don't mean physically, <clears throat> with all the other stuff, the one that gives a good example can affect the other one. And you have through history lots of those, just that time of Hollywood, um, that, uh, what was that, the 50s or something like that, or the 40s and 50s, <coughs> you had all these Catholics in Hollywood. In fact, you had the Father Peyton crusade against Hollywood and all this kind of stuff. So they, they kept their movies on a certain level that they wouldn't. And so they were making like, one of, the, one of the best movies I've ever seen on St. Francis was one of those Hollywood productions of the 50s. It was a good movie. They did make for St. Francis a weirdo. St. Clair, she became a nun actually afterwards. She's the one that kissed Elvis and became a nun. She's still a nun out there in Vermont. Mm -hmm. I think she's the abbess of a small Benedictine monastery that they, they burnt down and stuff like that. So, um, but anyways, they were up a lot of moral Catholics. Well, some of the men that were out there, um, they weren't living right. They were Catholic, but they weren't living right. They were cheating on their wives, but the wives stayed strong. And at the very end of their life, got their husband to convert, confess, and he might have been saved. I don't know all the different stories, so I'm probably confusing some of these. I just know that there was a handful of these cases with the husband and wife. They were Catholic, they were in Hollywood. The husband was cheating all the time, living badly. The wife stayed there at her post until she saved his soul. Try to do that today. So, but it's the focusing on your own I mean, those wives, the only way they could actually do that was to be able to focus on themselves. If they focused just on their husband, that would be crushing. Can you imagine? It'd be crushing. So only when the fire is kindled within will its warmth spread. For what is near at hand must be first to flame before what is distant can be reached. Concentrate then first upon yourself. Build up in your own character first by way of daily life, what is exemplary, and a zeal for your own personal righteousness. And so, will others take example from what they see in you? Show what skill you possess in helping others by your success in improving yourself. 
how many people there are who seem to know exactly what everyone else um, should do and are not only too anxious to get them to do it, but who, without any apparent misgivings, leave a great deal uh, uncorrected in their own lives. Such, too, are the sort of people who think how admirably they would get on in this or that position or office of responsibility. Okay, such, too, are those sort, uh, the sort of people who think how admirable they, admirably they would get on in, in this or that position or office of responsibility, but who, in the office they actually uh, do hold, are utterly listless and indifferent. As a result of advice or perhaps even of personal reflection, they may occasionally make a show of getting things in order, but, this is no, uh, but there is no system behind their efforts, and after a little while, they soon give up and slothful habits resume their, their sway. Be master over yourself. Train your mind and senses and body to obey at once the command of reason. That's what I mean when I say the principles. You got to have the main principles. Uh, so if something pops up, like you start becoming desirous of a position, you're able to reflect on the principle that that's not what a friar wants. A friar doesn't want to move up the chain. Do you see? Uh, we believe that God uh, providentially takes care of us. And that's also going to be through weak superiors. We have to have these, uh, the, the command of reason has to be reasoned by remembering these certain principles so that we're able to fall back on those and identify it and then mortify whatever that, because we're, we can't think that, well, I know I'm not supposed to want this, or I, I know I'm not, you know, we'll naturally tend towards those things. Our, our fallen concupiscence will naturally tend to, towards certain things. Uh, by having the principles, we can identify what we're doing and we can check it. Do you see? That's what we want to do. To occupy themselves with what is good, to hold aloof from what is evil. Keep a grip upon your imagination and upon your eyes, hands, <clears throat> ears, and tongue, lest they wander insolently beyond all bounds. They are like wild animals, domesticated for the moment, but if restraint be removed, apt to become as savage as before. Do you see? Especially any of you who have struggled with certain things out in the world, um, you have to be all the more careful. The hands only do certain things. The eyes only go to certain places. The thoughts are only allowed certain things. You have, you have to have that and you can never let it go. No, no. It's a lifelong thing of knowing where the hands go, where the eyes go, where the thoughts go. Otherwise... They grow insolent and are only brought back under great control of reason with the greatest difficulty. The perverse are hard to be corrected, Ecclesiastes one fifteen. That is, harder than those who, having uh, as yet barely made a start in the spiritual life, have had no occasion to stiffen into evil habits. We must begin with animals that are young if we would train them uh, to serve our use or pleasure. A tender sapling can be bent as we will, but not a tree. A young mind is quicker to learn than an older one. In fact, all the holiest friars I've ever met entered religious life when they were between the ages of 11 and 12. They were the holiest I'd ever met. And why? Because they were fixed in that before they even started novitiate. It just, this is what, what being a friar is. So you get to them, they're older, like Father Gabriel, he entered when he was 11 years old, and there wasn't any deliberation. Um, and most of you have heard the story. The, the older brother, the Franciscans, after they got destroyed in the 1800s, the, to rebuild back up, they started these schools. And the schools were very popular, and they did a lot of good. They did a lot of good. But they also got a lot of vocations from those, uh, the, the fratini, the little, the little friars, because they all wore habits in the friary. That's who the 800 there in St. Maximilian Colby's, those were all, you know, a bunch of them were fratini. And uh, the house that we were in, Sasso Ferrato, 
I saw pictures of them all processing down the hallway, and they're just all little kids in habits. Um, but then later on in the 60s, they started putting in swimming pools. We had an underground swimming pool there at Bilbochea. It was abandoned, but I found it one day. I was like, this is a swimming pool. Uh, but anyways, uh, one of the older brothers was supposed to go to the school, and uh, the, the friar showed up to collect him one day, and the kid didn't want to go anymore. So the mother of a big family just said, does anybody else want to go? And Father Gabriel's like, I'll go. What that meant was, I'm leaving home forever. He was 11 years old. <laughs> so that's how kind of detached everybody was. Well, I'll go. Okay, you go pack your bag and we'll never see you again. I mean, you know, I'm sure he saw his mom again, but that you move in at that point. You're in school from 11 years old until you turn 16. At 16, you start novitiate. At 17, you can profess. And then he was, um, you know, solemnly professed a few years later. And so he's already a solemn professed friar years before he ever gets the holy orders. And he's already finished with all of his school. So he's been studying all this stuff from the time he's 11 years old. Do you see? So by the time you get to him and he's 80 years old, you, you have this, or I mean, I didn't know, my father's probably in his 80s now, but you know, he, was, he was only in his 70s there. You just have this docile, meek, beautiful soul that um, everybody can relate to. Why? Because he's a saint. He's a saint, and he, he, you get to go knock on his door, and you get to talk to him. Do you see? Everybody knows it. He, he probably knows it, too. He just sits there all day staring at a, at a picture of St. Anthony. Whenever you knock on the door, you go in there. He's just sitting there. That's all he does. It's an important guy I know, and you're just sitting in your cell staring at this picture of St. Anthony. <clears throat> well, he became a friar when he was 11. You see? He didn't have all these problems that everybody has nowadays. That, that's, that's the way you do it. You take a young soul, and you form it into a, a way of life, and then... They're, they're off and running doing that until they die. Do you see? It's a beautiful thing, but we don't have that now because they won't let the people, they, you're not allowed to have them come until they're at least 18 years old, and by that time they're perverted.